Joining us this evening is author and educator Becky LaVoy. Becky holds a master's in education and a bachelor's in biology and has over 20 years of experience as an educator. She works full time as education outreach specialist with Ocean Soil Conservation District. In addition, Becky is an adjunct professor for Keene University, as well as the instructor for the Gar Barnegat Bay Master's Naturalist course offered through the Barnegat Bay Partnership in Ocean County College. She also leads birding and plant tours for Well Mills County Park in Ocean County, New Jersey. Becky volunteers her time as co-leader for the New Jersey Shore Chapter of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. She is a co-author of The Kids Guide to Exploring Nature. You can find it on Amazon, uh, published by Brooklyn Botanical Garden. When not teaching about soil conservation or leading people on outdoor adventures, Becky can usually be found behind a pair of binoculars as an avid and devoted birder. She enjoys landscaping her own yard to attract and support birds and strives to inspire others to make small but positive changes in home landscaping practices that benefit both wildlife and humans. And now this is her show, so I'm gonna switch you over to Becky. Thank you so much, Nadja, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you so much to the Ocean County Library for inviting me here tonight to present my program called Attracting Birds to Your Jersey Friendly Yard. So as the education outreach specialist for the Ocean County Soil Conservation District in Ocean County, New Jersey, I offer a variety of educational programs that bring awareness to the importance of natural resources, including soil and water and plants and wildlife. Programs that promote environmental stewardship throughout our local Barnegat Bay watershed on the Jersey Shore. So if you're tuning in tonight, I anticipate you are interested in birds and interested in gardening. And your role as a backyard gardener is a really important role. It's an important way for you to be an environmental steward of your local watershed as well. So in your backyard, perhaps like me, you have chickadees that are right now raising their family in your yard as they do each summer. And maybe they're visiting your feeders and they flit about calling chickadee dee dee. And pictured here is a Carolina chickadee, which in a Southern New Jersey, is a Southern New Jersey species. And it looks almost identical to the black cap chickadee, which is a Northern New Jersey species. Carolina chickadees are considered endemic to the continental United States, meaning they are not found in any other country or area of the world. And they are one of only 12 species of endemics in the continental United States. And both Carolina and black cap chickadees are considered non-migratory residents. So they're part of your backyard family. And if you are tuning in from northern New Jersey, you most likely have black cap chickadees residing in your yard. And because it looks almost identical to the Carolina chickadee, location is really the best guide to determining between these two different species. And both Carolina and black caps are non-migratory residents. And as I said, they're part of our backyard family of birds. And maybe you have song sparrows in your yard who remind you each morning to please, please, please put on your tea kettle, kettle, kettle. So humans create mnemonics, which are phrases that string together the syllables and notes of a bird song, making it easier to remember its rhythm, pitch, and tempo. And song sparrows are considered a resident in some areas or a short to medium distance migrant in other areas. So birds from distant Alaska 
and northern Canada, they migrate the farthest, flying to the southern United States and to northern Mexico to winter. And song sparrows from the northern United States may migrate, but typically don't go as far south as the birds that started from even farther north. And this is a pattern called leapfrog migration. Perhaps your yard is visited by our New Jersey state bird, the American goldfinch, who brightens each day with their cheery yellow colors. American goldfinches are short distance migrants. They travel south in winter to places where the minimum January temperature is no colder than zero degrees Fahrenheit for any considerable amount of time. Or perhaps you have woodpeckers who visit your yard, such as this red-bellied woodpecker on the left or this hairy woodpecker on the right. And they are both non-migratory residents. And birds from some northern populations may wander away from their home range during the winter. And birds that breed inland or at high elevations sometimes move to the coast or to lower elevations during some winters. And woodpeckers, chickadees, song sparrows and goldfinches are only a few of the vast array of bird species with whom we share our yards and our everyday lives. It's possible you're lucky enough to have the majestic pileated woodpecker visit your feeders. The pileated woodpecker is our largest woodpecker out of the seven woodpecker species that make their home in New Jersey. So in my program today, I'm going to introduce you to some of my favorite species of birds and share ways that you can attract them to your yard. And some key ideas I will address are the ecological connections between birds and plants, how to mimic nature or how to use the natural semblance of plants to support a diversity of bird species in your yard, and I'll highlight specific plant species with a bit of a focus on trees and shrubs that would make a great addition to a bird friendly yard. And I'll showcase some important human made but nature inspired features that you can add to your yard to attract and support birds. And finally, I'll introduce you to the Jersey Friendly Yards website which offers a plethora of tools and information and resources to help you select appropriate bird-friendly plants for your yard and create appropriate bird-friendly habitat in your home landscape. But first I wanna provide you with some background information about our fine feathered friends. So birds are truly special creatures. They are the only living creatures on the planet who have feathers and feathers help birds stay dry and warm. And colorful feathers help this male wood duck find a mate. But the beautiful brown feathers of the female offer camouflage while she sits on her nest and rears her ducklings in woodland streams. Wood ducks live year round in the east and along the west coast, and some populations travel to the interior west to spend the winter. And they thrive best in freshwater wetlands with plenty of vegetative cover consisting of trees, both standing and fallen, and shrubs and emergent herbaceous plants. And true to their name, wood ducks nest in tree cavities high in the canopy. Wooded wetlands are necessary for their survival. Trees in particular are an important component to a bird-friendly backyard habitat. Beneath the canopy of trees on the forest floor, the blend of brown, tan, and white feathers of this ground nesting Chuck Will's widow offer the perfect camouflage against a backdrop of oak and holly leaves. A member of the family called nightjars, this beautiful nocturnal bird rests during the day and hunts for insects at dusk. She also relies on fallen leaves to camouflage her precious egg 
a good reason to leave the leaves. Of course, feathers also aid in flight. Feathers grow in specific groups and patterns on a bird's body. Primary and secondary wing feathers allow birds to take to the skies. These wing feathers are anchored to the bone by a strong ligament so they can withstand the demands and pressures of flight. And this allows the feathers to be precisely positioned for aerial maneuvering. One of the most interesting facts about birds, in my opinion, is that they are descendants of dinosaurs. Over 160 million years ago, some dinosaurs began to grow feathers. The precursors of feathers were bristle-like and hollow, which gradually evolved into complex structures, and they did not evolve from scales. The evolution of feathers gave rise to true birds. Modern scientists who study birds often refer to them as avian reptiles. About 66 million years ago, a meteor ended the Cretaceous period and wiped out the dinosaurs and most avian reptiles, except for a few ground-dwelling species. And one of the surviving species gave rise to the modern ostrich group. Another surviving species gave rise to modern ducks, geese, and chickens. And a third surviving species gave rise to all other modern birds. The general consensus of ornithologists is that there are about 10,000 species of birds on the planet today. And the, the diversity of these species is incredible and the product of millions of years of evolution. There is a species that fills every niche on earth from tiny hummingbirds to songbirds and shorebirds, wading birds, sea ducks, woodpeckers, grassland birds, raptors, owls, and nightjars, and so many others with whom we share our world. On the other hand, several species of birds have been very successful adapting to the changes in the landscape created by humans. In cities in the United States, several species of birds are experts at living and surviving among minimal natural resources available in urban areas, including pigeons, house sparrows, and European starlings. All non-native species of birds to New Jersey with an ability to outcompete other native species. They are very successful in our cities, in our suburbs, and even in rural areas. And just like invasive plants, predictably, these invasive birds have expanded their range beyond cities and beyond suburbs and invaded our agricultural areas. And pictured here are European starlings. They form really large flocks, sometimes numbering in the hundreds or even thousands, and they outcompete native species for food, for nesting places, and for other dwindling resources. In many suburban areas, we've cleared the land of all native vegetation. We have built large homes that fill most of the lot and we've planted non-native shrubs and trees and installed thirsty turf grass. And very few native species of birds or other wildlife can adapt and survive in this food desert. However, it's suitable for invasive species like house sparrows who only survive in the immediate proximity of people. But luckily, homeowners are beginning to wake up to the damaging effects of our sterile yards, thanks to the extraordinary efforts of folks conducting the scientific research and leading the conversations, such as Dr. Doug Tallamy, who wrote the book called Backyards for Nature. And if this book is not yet part of your resource collection, I highly recommend this colorful and easy to read 
Homeowner's Guide to Backyard Landscaping. And Dr. Doug Tallamy also co-authored The Living Landscape with Rick Dark. And other favorite landscaping resources include Planting in a Post-Wild World by Thomas Rayner and Claudia West, and Integrated Landscaping, Following Nature's Lead, authored by Lauren Chase Rowell, Mary Tebow Davis, Ka Catherine Hartnett, and Marilyn Wisga. And the homeowners who live in this corner lot have made a concerted effort to diversify their landscape with a variety of native plants, which support a variety of native bird species. And they included shrub, uh, trees and shrubs and flowering perennials and native grasses in their small landscape. And there's a growing movement of people who wish to reconnect with nature. And we're all realizing the need and the value of creating healthier landscapes for both humans and wildlife. And the more habitat we create in our yards, the more birds we can attract and support, including our beloved backyard birds such as blue jays and Carolina wren, tufted titmouse, and ruby-throated hummingbird as well as migrant species who rely on the resources in our yards to successfully complete their twice annual long distance journey and raise their families so that they maintain and build their populations. Above is a red-eyed vireo sipping water at a bird bath offered by a homeowner. And this yellow warbler gleans caterpillars from native plants to feed his nestlings. A wood thrush sings from a shady perch, announcing his arrival at his breeding grounds and calls for his mate. And this rose-breasted grosbeak is poised to take a turn at a nearby feeder as it continues its migration. These birds benefit from backyards that provide food, water, shelter, and safe places to raise a family. Of the approximately 10,000 species of birds in the world, 1,120 species have been documented in what's called the ABA area, the American Birding Association area. And it includes all 50 states, plus Canada, two French islands off the coast of Northeastern Canada, and all adjacent waters to a distance of about 200 miles from land or half the distance to a neighboring country, whichever is less. New Jersey has a wonderful diversity of birds. The New Jersey Birds Records Committee has documented 480 different species of birds known to have set foot within New Jersey's borders. So New Jersey is the fourth smallest state in the union Yet we host about 43% of all bird species in the United States and Canada. Such a diversity of birds. How is that possible? Well, New Jersey is situated in a geographic sweet spot. The northern portion of New Jersey is the southernmost limit of many plants of the Northeast. And the southern portion of New Jersey is the northernmost limit of many plants of the southeast. Northern New Jersey has three distinct physiographic regions, each determined by distinctly different geologic features, each supporting slightly different plant communities. And then all of South Jersey is part of the coastal plain which can be further divided into the intercoastal plain, a thin corridor along the Delaware River, and the outer coastal plain, which spans the Pine Barrens, which is its own unique ecosystem, and reaching the Bay and Atlantic Ocean. And the diversity of plant communities supports diversity in habitat, which supports diversity of wildlife, including birds. So this biodiversity ensures stability, resistance, and resilience in the landscape, which we need because of climate change. 
So homeowners in this particular Jersey friendly backyard considered the concept of an ecosystem when planning their landscape. An ecosystem is a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. So depending on where you live, either near the coast or in the mountains, in a development that was once a grassland or in a community built on land that was once a forest, Keep in mind the features of these natural, natural ecosystems to gain inspiration and to help guide your bird-friendly landscape plan for your yard, but of course, at a smaller scale. So within this ecosystem, where a bird finds everything it needs to survive, including food, water, shelter, and a place to raise its family, is the habitat. So in this backyard, the habitat is a blend of native plants as well as man-made features such as feeders, a bird bath, and other carefully selected nature-inspired structures. And because New Jersey is part of the larger Eastern deciduous forest region, Trees and shrubs in particular create a complex habitat for birds. So as I continue this presentation, I'm first going to focus on trees and shrubs as staples for a bird-friendly yard. And then I'll introduce additional plants. A tree with a spreading canopy, such as this maple, will provide the overstory. A smaller tree or tall shrubs such as redbud or winterberry holly or red chokeberry provide the base structure of the understory. And below are smaller shrubs, flowers, ferns, and grasses. And different bird species utilize different levels of this vertical landscape to find their food and their nesting places and roosting places and places where they can seek shelter. And the homeowners of this yard also added a branch dug into the ground vertically like a post for the purpose of offering a perch for a Cooper's hawk or a hummingbird. And they also added logs and rocks offering places for birds to hide from predators or find shade and shelter or a safe place to take a dust bath. And they also added bird feeders and water features and nest boxes tucked within the trees and shrubs, as well as other natural ornaments, mimicking elements found in nature. And they not only added a creative and decorative touch, these natural features provide places for animals to relax and to roost and to thrive. So let's take a closer look to see how this ensemble of plants will attract and benefit a diversity of birds. This migrating golden crowned kinglet forages on this native red maple, looking for caterpillars and other insects that overwintered on this tree. Kinglets are very small birds, larger than a hummingbird, but smaller than a chickadee. They forage at mid-level to the top of the canopy, and they have high energy and rarely sit still. They use their small tweezer-like bill to pluck tiny insects from the branches. Luckily for the kinglet, 285 different species of caterpillars use a maple as a host plant, according to entomologist Dr. Doug Tallamy, who I mentioned earlier. Red maple is one of the earliest flowering trees. The early spring blooming red flowers of red maple are a beacon for birds and make the tree easy for humans to identify. Emerging new growth on red maple, including fruit, twigs, and leaf stalks are all red. Box elder, another member of the maple family, also hosts caterpillars, teeny tiny caterpillars, and is just as attractive to the birds. 
it satisfies the needs of this female pine warbler migrating through. There are 37 species of warblers recorded in the east. Warblers are small, predominantly insect eating birds, and many have brilliant colors and patterns. They spend most of the time in uh, down south of the United States, but they head north to breed and most pass through New Jersey as they're doing right now, seeking more northerly habitats in order to breed and raise a family. So spring migration, which is at its peak uh, right now, uh, it starts late April and goes through the end of May, is the best time to catch a glimpse of a warbler. Oak trees are another great choice for your backyard canopy. Oaks support 534 species of caterpillars. This northern perula, another species of warbler, relies on these tiny caterpillars and other insects to provide them with the fuel they need to sustain their energy for their long trip from Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean to up north. Because warblers are insect eaters, most won't be stopping at your feeders for seed. They require native plants in the landscape, which host the tiny caterpillars. Some caterpillars are overlooked by the birds, like this polyphemus moth caterpillar. The polyphemus moth uses oak as one of its host plants. And here it is pupating inside its blanket of oak leaves. And it started out this tiny. Birds have keen eyesight, much better than humans. They can see a wider range of wavelengths, including ultraviolet. They track motion better, and they see as much as 360 degrees at once in peripheral vision with multiple focal points. So they're able to track down and see these teeny tiny caterpillars that we humans would overlook. This beautiful polyphemus moth emerges from the leaves, although it too may become food for birds. So leaving the leaves is a concept you've uh, most likely heard before possibly. So leaving the leaves is not always ideal or possible in our yards, but perhaps raking your leaves into a shallow pile in a corner of your yard will not only offer habitat for moth and butterfly larvae, the caterpillars, but will also benefit the birds. So wrapped inside these wild black cherry leaves is the caterpillar of a cecropia moth. And here is the adult. Many insects spend the winter clinging to a branch, insulated by leaves or other natural structures. A praying mantis may deposit her protective egg case on the twigs of your shrubs, which in turn will benefit the birds. This tufted titmouse is excavating this high protein, energy rich winter food source. The tufted titmouse is a common backyard bird. They visit feeders for seeds, nuts, and suet. And once they find a suitable seed from your feeder, they fly to a nearby branch to eat. And holding the seed within their toes, they hammer the seed with their strong, relatively thick bill to crack it open and consume the seed meat inside. The tufted titmouse is a cavity nester. It requires ready-made holes in trees, but may also use a human-made nest box. Oaks are a dominant tree species in our eastern deciduous forest region and an excellent choice for your backyard canopy. There are over 50 oak species in eastern North America to choose from. All oaks produce acorns and acorns are food for wild turkeys and other wildlife, including squirrels and mice. And this benefits the birds. 
This immature red-shouldered hawk enjoys a meal in the safety of the canopy. Raptors, also known as birds of prey, are what are what are called a keystone species and without which an ecosystem would fail. Trees are a key component of a bird-friendly ecosystem in the East Coast. So this oak tree in the backyard of this Jersey-friendly gardener sprang up from an acorn, a gift from the squirrels, no doubt. It was nurtured and now this oak tree is beautiful. It's 20 to 30 foot high and in its shade are planted woodland sunflowers, which you can see growing in the forefront. And the woodland sunflowers can grow to about six feet tall. So consider planting flowers, ferns, and native ground covers beneath your trees. Birds benefit from the hiding places that they offer as well as the food. I have a very large patch of woodland sunflowers growing outside my kitchen window where I enjoy watching American goldfinches devour the soft seeds in the summer. And woodland sunflowers bloom in both sun and shade. Birch trees are prized for their beautiful bark and their delicate foliage. However, if you don't select the right species of birch for the conditions in your yard, your tree may not live to its ripe age of about 30 to 50 years as it would in a natural setting. A safe bet though is the highly cultivated fast growing river birch. It is the most adaptable of the native birches and can tolerate dry soil, heavy clay, heat, drought, deer, and pollution. And this distinctive orange peeling bark of the river birch makes this an attractive tree for any backyard. But if you decide on a gray birch, a leaning or toppled trunk in your yard is a prized resource for some birds. It acts as a daytime roost for a common nighthawk, a cousin to the Chuck Wills widow. The gray camouflage colors of the bark conceal her presence from predators. Considered small trees, gray birch can reach heights between 20 to 40 feet with a spread of about 10 to 20 feet. They maintain a slender trunk and a narrow crown and have beautiful bark. One of my favorite trees is the sun-loving sweet gum. This one volunteered in my backyard, most likely a gift from the birds who disperse the seeds. Sweet gum is a typical plant of swamps and floodplains where the soil is rich. However, it also tolerates a wide range of soil conditions and is very healthy and happy in my very dry sandy soil. It grows a rounded crown as it ages. And leaves are star shaped with five to seven pointed fine toothed lobes and they turn amazing colors in the fall, yellow and purple and red and orange. Sweet gum trees have separate male and female flowers, but both flowers are found on the same tree. So all trees will have the fruit. On top, you can see here are the male flowers containing the stamen and the pollen, and hanging down are the female flowers containing the sticky stigma ready to receive the wind-blown pollen. The female flowers are termed capitulate, and capitulate means that there are many very small flowers all attached at the same point on the flowering stem and the wind blows the pollen from the male flowers on the top to the female flowers on the bottom, after which the male flowers wilt and fall to the ground and the female flowers mature. So the ovary swells into what you're probably very familiar with, that pointy gumball fruit, and that's actually protecting both uh, the seeds inside. There's two different types of seeds. Uh, one is fertilized, one is not fertilized. 
um, and they both contain nutrients for the birds that eat them. So right in the center of this photo is a female red-winged blackbird, and she is foraging in a sweet gum tree. And to the bottom right is a photo of the more recognizable male, red-winged blackbird. And he's showing off his red shoulder patch called an epaulette. Many, many birds feast on sweet gum seeds, including chickadee, dark-eyed junco, Carolina wren, chipping sparrow, northern cardinal, purple finch, common red pole, eastern towhee, pine siskin, white-throated sparrow, white-crowned sparrow, wild turkey, morning dove, quail, wood ducks, and mallards, and surely many, many more. And I've heard many folks proclaim that they will never plant a sweet gum tree in their yard because it's too difficult to mow under the canopy and the gumballs ruin the lawnmower. So to that, if I may suggest, don't mow under the sweet gum tree. It has very shallow roots and does not tolerate compacted soil caused by constant mowing. So instead, plant attractive native grasses at the sunny base of your sweet gum tree. And seeds of native grasses provide food for birds and their leaves provide cover and nesting material. Native grasses are important host plants for native butterflies and moths, and they need minimal to zero care. So try planting switchgrass in sunny areas of your yard, and enjoy watching the goldfinches feast in the fall. And if you need more convincing to consider a sweet gum for your yard, it is a host plant for more than 30 species of butterfly and moth caterpillars, including this gorgeous luna moth. And here's a, a picture again of my sweet gum tree in my backyard. And to the right, you may have been wondering what that is. It's an Eastern screech owl nest box. And Eastern screech owls are actually more common than you may think. And they can be found wherever there are trees. And as you can see, they will readily take to a nest box, even in very, very small yards. And the box should be on a post at least 10 feet high with a predator guard and install your box by the end of the summer. So the owls will use it to roost in the winter. My owls usually arrive in November. And if you're lucky, they will start a family in late winter. My husband and I have had screech owls in our uh, box for several years. Uh, some years we've had a gray morph and some years a red morph as pictured here. Um, for two years, uh, we had two owls, one gray, one red, and this year our owl stayed the longest it's ever stayed. It actually, uh, the last time it was seen was about a week ago. So we were crossing our fingers that there were babies in the box, but we haven't seen uh, the red owl for quite, for about a week now. So we're, we're thinking that maybe next year. Uh, behind the owl box is uh, a beautiful evergreen spruce you can see back there and I highly recommend an evergreen tree in every bird fr friendly yard and there are many beautiful uh, native evergreens to choose from. One of my favorites we have in our yard is an eastern red cedar. We actually have several in our yard. They are considered a small to medium tree and reaching heights between 20 to 50 feet. And the lower branch, branches can be pruned as you can see here. And we've created a nice shady space below for um, a bird bath. So here is our bird bath at the base of our Eastern red cedars. And I've planted some Eastern columbine, which is a very versatile plant. It tolerates both sun and shade and has really lush foliage that remains green throughout the summer season, even after the beautiful uh, bell-shaped red and yellow flowers um, have come and gone. 
Uh, they actually bloom now, uh, April and May, and they're very attractive to hummingbirds. I love watching a hummingbird zoom up to one of the flowers and sip, sip ne nectar. So hummingbirds, uh, we have what's called a ruby-throated hummingbirds. They're the only hummingbird species that migrates east of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, the bird is an iridescent green on the head and the back and the wings with white underneath. And males have a red gorget. Uh, this is a photo of a young male who is just starting to grow his ruby throat. The, the color does not involve pigment. Instead, the structure of the feather surface amplifies uh, the color of light. You can attract ruby-throated hummingbirds to your yard by hanging a feeder. One part sugar to three parts clean, fresh water. Hummingbirds build their nests directly on top of a slender branch, usually on deciduous trees, including oak, birch, poplar, uh, hornbeam, and sometimes in pine or holly. She uses thistle, dandelion down, or other soft plant material held together with spider silk or pine resin. She camouflages the nest with lichen and moss. By planting a variety of these plants in your yard, even embracing your dandelions, you can help support hummingbirds. Water is an important component of a bird-friendly yard. The bird bath under my cedar tree is visited by many species who fly in for a sip of water or fly in to take a bath. And when finished bathing, this gray catbird can fly up to the safety of the eastern red cedar branches and make sure the coast is clear before flying off. Eastern red cedars tolerate nutrient poor soil and a wide range in pH, as well as salty conditions, air pollution, and deer. And the reddish brown bark exfoliates in thin shreddy strips on mature trees. And the bark is used by cardinals and fish crows as nesting material. Fish crows also eat the berries. Eastern red cedar is not a true cedar. It's a juniper. It's called Juniperus virginiana. And the berries are commonly called juniper berries although they are actually unusually shaped cones, not berries. This tree is what's called dioecious, meaning that it has separate male and female plants. And you'll need one of each in the yard or in the neighborhood for the female to be able to produce the fruit or the cones. Male trees produce something called uh, stroboli, which are brown structures that offer pollen and female trees have round have the round berries. Um, they're actually called uh, blue stroboli with soft scales that uh, kind of coalesce into a round berry like cone. Uh, they ripen in the fall and they make an excellent food source for yellow rumped warblers as you see here uh, that are migrating through in the fall. In fact, over 80 species of birds eat these berry-like cones. The American robin depends on this tree's berries in the winter when other food sources are scarce. And the birds in turn provide the important service of seed dispersal, which is insurance for woodlands. So if you do in fact have an Eastern red cedar in the neighborhood, it's likely you'll find one volunteering in your yard a gift from the birds. Eastern red cedar is considered an early successional tree and one of the first trees to occupy disturbed soils. And due to its high salt tolerance, this tree can grow atop a hummock. A hummock is a mound of soil in a salt marsh. And a hummock can be artificially created by depositing dredged spoils. And a hummock of eastern red cedars provides many species of large wading birds a really valuable resource. This endangered yellow crowned night heron family is nesting in an eastern red cedar rookery. 
And the night herons share the rookery with this family of great egrets. Aren't those babies so cute? And these juvenile glossy ibis learn to fly within the safety of the eastern red cedar canopy. And among the branches of the cedar is an entanglement of Virginia creeper vines. And Virginia creeper is a beauty, one of my favorite native vines. Small greenish white flowers bloom May through August, which lead to one of the most attractive fruits. Clusters of berries turn from pink to blue to dark purple, showcased on the tip of a bright red stem. The berries are valued as food by many birds. Star-shaped leaves turn deep red crimson in the fall. Virginia creeper vines climb up my eastern red cedar trees each season, but they don't strangle the tree, nor are they parasitic. They double the food and the flavor for birds, and then they're easy to pull down from the tree or snip with clippers. And tucked safely within the evergreen boughs of this eastern red cedar is a northern stalwart owl enjoying a meal. Dense branches create a thick and protective canopy for shelter, roosting, and eating. But first she's got to make room. So my birder friend and photographer, Carmela Moneta, captured the owl expelling a pellet before eating her next meal. So although, although the eastern red cedar will tolerate some shade as a sapling, it needs sunlight as it matures. And this tree's native range extends the entire eastern half of the United States, offering a widely available food source along the migratory flyway. So pine trees are another evergreen choice for a bird-friendly backyard. All pines produce cones, and the familiar pine cone is rounded or egg-shaped with woody scales arranged in a spiral pattern. And scales protect the seeds, which are coveted by many birds. And this red-breasted nuthatch has a tiny, slightly upcurved bill, and she uses it like a lever or a crowbar to extract the seeds from the cone. And she's very comfortable foraging upside down and able to angle her approach in ways that other birds can't, filling another niche in nature. And she is successful. Pine warblers are also attracted to pine trees. And in addition to eating pine seeds, they forage among the branches looking for caterpillars and other bugs. And pine warblers nearly always build their nests in pine trees located in pine forests or in mixed pine deciduous forests, usually high in the canopy, concealed among the cones and needles. The nest is built using grasses and plant stems and bark strips, fine rootlets and pine needles. And the cup of the nest is lined with spider silk, feathers, fur, and the down of soft plant materials. And across much of the range, native pine forests have been destroyed or altered by logging development or through uh, fire suppression. And over the past few decades, Pines have been introduced into deciduous for forests in the east, and the pine warblers have taken up residence. And there are many native pine species for you to choose from for your bird-friendly backyard. So these are pine siskins, and as their name suggests, pine siskins have a fondness for seeds of pines and other conifers like cedars, larch, hemlock, and spruce. They also feed on seeds from deciduous trees such as alder, birch, sweet gum, and maples. And they eat the young buds of willows, elms, uh, and maples, and they'll glean the seeds of grasses and dandelions and chickweed and sunflowers and goldenrod. They also forage for insects and spiders and grubs from leaves and branch tips, and occasionally will take insects from the air. So before seaside goldenrod goes to seed, the flowers offer an important nectar source for migrating monarchs. And migrating ruby crown kinglets also benefit by gleaning tiny insects from the goldenrod. 
as they also migrate down the coastal flyway south for the winter. The seeds of seaside goldenrod are tiny and soft, so that's perfect for the pine siskins. And the pine siskins feed readily at backyard feeders, preferring the smaller seeds uh, without the tough shells like the thistle. And pine siskins have been reported drinking sap from sap wells drilled by yellow-bellied sapsuckers. Uh, this one was busy drilling its wells when I snapped this photo. Bark of many evergreen tree species tend to be thick or blocky, which protects them, uh, protects the tree from fire and heat and disease. Bugs hide in the cracks and crevices of bark, but the red-bellied woodpecker has just the right tools to extract them. The strong bill is used for excavation and the long tongue is used for extraction. Their tongue is barbed and has a sticky tip and tiny muscles in their tongue allow the woodpecker to maneuver it in any direction in order to trap prey and pry insects and larvae out of their hiding places. And their neck is really long and strong and flexible. The woodpecker's foot has two toes facing forward and two toes facing backward, allowing for a strong grip. And you can see how it uses its stiff tail as a prop positioned for strength and balance. So pine trees grow very tall and are often selected by raptors as nest locations, perching platforms, or dinner tables. So incorporate a pine tree in your backyard ecosystem and invite a peregrine falcon for dinner. And this hollowed out pine tree is coveted real estate for cavity nesting birds, such as this Carolina chickadee. She's cleaning out the wood debris inside as she prepares the nursery. And she'll line her nest with soft materials she finds on the forest floor, left behind by other mammals with whom she shares the woodland or backyard habitat, such as this Eastern cottontail. Or you can offer her some soft nesting material. Chickadees, tufted titmouse, and other birds will come pull out what they need. You can also install a nest box in your yard for chickadees. This chickadee made her nest using moss, soft grasses, and fur. And this yellow warbler also uses fur, hair, and other soft plant materials to line her nest. This northern white pine was planted in this backyard about 15 to 20 years ago, mixed with other native trees, including oak, maple, redbud, and a uh, non-native but Jersey-friendly star magnolia. It now provides a wonderful privacy border along the back fence, as well as habitat for birds, providing food, shelter, and protection. It's inevitable that trees may lose some branches, Spring cleanup includes picking up branches and sticks that have fallen to the ground in winter, but this is a gold mine for the birds. So pile up the branches into a brush pile. Birds will use it to escape predators, such as this Cooper's hawk. I have several brush piles in my yard, some in the corners of my yard where Carolina wrens forage for bugs, but I also have one in the middle of my yard to offer some shelter and protection so the small birds can fly safely from one side of the yard to the other and dive into the brush pile if they feel the need. Like pine trees, the American holly is an easily recognizable tree with broad evergreen leaves. This black-throated green warbler forages for insects during spring migration. And blue-gray gnatcatchers breed in the Northeast, and this gnatcatcher gleans caterpillars and other insects to feed its young from the holly tree. Fruit ripens by the end of the fall and persists throughout the winter, offering a crucial food source for birds such as American robins. 
And robins are often joined at the holly tree by regal cedar waxwings who are highly social and also travel in large flocks searching for berries in winter. So invite birds to your yard with these two fantastic native shrubs, winterberry holly and inkberry holly. Both shrubs have a heightened spread of about six to 10 feet. They prefer acidic soils and moist to wet conditions, although they can both tolerate drier conditions once they are established. And I have them both growing in my dry sandy soil in my yard. And while I was birding this past fall, I observed a Swainson's thrush foraging on inkberry holly. And one of the most satisfying things to me is to watch birds eat seeds and berries in the wild or especially in my yard. And then when I plant these important resources and have them growing in my yard, I know that I'm providing sustenance for the birds and making a positive impact on the larger landscape. So recall winterberry holly growing in this uh, backyard landscape I showed earlier in the program. It's growing as part of the understory. So if you look under the shrubs, there's a purposeful open space, a protective shelter for secretive sparrows, such as this Eastern towhee, who likes to scratch the ground and turn over leaves looking for food. Sparrows, such as towhees, occupy the lower levels of the ecosystem, utilizing medium to small shrubs, ferns, grasses, flowering herbs, and ground covers for food, nesting places, and shelter. And around the flower beds, the homeowner carefully placed logs to create a natural looking border. And similar to the brush pile concept, the organisms decomposing the logs slowly break down the wood and add organic matter to the soil, while also providing a food source for birds, such as the northern flicker, which is a woodpecker who forages for worms, grubs, and other soft invertebrates in logs, in brush piles, and in other natural debris on the ground. I commonly see northern flickers come to the logs that border my garden foraging for bugs. So some other bird-friendly berry producing shrubs include northern bayberry and winged sumac. Northern bayberry is an upright, multi-trunked, semi-evergreen shrub with narrow evergreen leaves. And the waxy berries of northern, berry, northern bayberry uh, grow in tight clusters and ripen in October and remain on the plant well into the winter. And this flock of tree swallows is foraging for berries on this group of northern bayberries. Winged sumac offers another important food source for birds. Berries ripen to a bright red in the fall and linger through the winter when food is otherwise scarce. And like Northern Bayberry and Eastern Red Cedar, sumac is an early pioneer species that grows fairly quickly and spreads vegetatively by sprouting from its root crown but it can rapidly colonize an area and is probably best suited for larger yards. Summer sweet or sweet pepper bush prefers partial shade, slightly moist soil, and makes an excellent understory shrub. It's extremely attractive to pollinators such as these tiny soldier beetles that congregate on the flowers. And it's also visited by native bees and butterflies, including the spice bush swallowtail, as well as by hummingbirds. And the flowers are followed by a dry fruit capsule that holds seeds, which are enjoyed by birds like this American goldfinch. Spice bush is at the top of my list of beautiful native backyard shrubs. It prefers part shade, but also grows in full sun and also tolerates heavy shade. It is also dioecious. It has separate male and female plants. So both are required in order for the female to bear the fruit 
which is a red droop that ripens in the fall, another source for birds. It's also host to spice bush swallowtail caterpillars who start life looking like a bird dropping and turn into a beautiful large butterfly. Here's a spice bush growing in a residential backyard landscape and it's overhanging a small pond placed at the edge of the lawn. So you can dig a hole the size of the tub and then drop it into the ground to attract frogs and toads and dragonflies and birds uh, who all benefit from this easy to maintain water feature. And this is red chokeberry. Uh, another uh, possible addition of a shrub to your yard. So even adding just a single tree or a single shrub is an excellent way to attract and support birds. The flowers of red chokeberry bloom in the spring beautiful white petals with bright pink anthers and the flowers are followed by red berries that persist in winter and offer food for birds. And this is my bird friendly front yard. So as we've discussed trees are part of the larger forest ecosystem and an important component of a bird friendly yard. And this may look like an eyesore to anyone driving by my yard, but to me, it is a beautiful bird habitat. And this tree was actually home to two uh, red-bellied woodpecker families in past years. And this year, we are so excited to have a great crested flycatcher family. They're just starting to uh, build their nest right now. And here is the red-bellied woodpecker a couple years ago when it lived and raised its family in this dead tree. This family actually is uh, raising babies in our dead tree we have in our backyard this year. So after the babies fledged, we were so delighted when the parents introduced their youngsters to our feeders. And this young male was learning how to extract peanuts from the feeders. So when a tree in the forest dies, sunlight reaches the forest floor, encouraging the growth of vines and sun-loving plants. So I wrapped chicken wire around the trunk of my dead tree and planted coral honeysuckle, and you can see it growing up and around the trunk. And coral honeysuckle, also called trumpet honeysuckle, has beautiful red flowers that bloom May through June. They're blooming right now and they are a magnet for the ruby-throated hummingbirds. But if you don't have a dead tree in your yard to offer birds as a cavity for nesting, you can install nest boxes. Uh, Nestwatch.org is a wonderful resource created by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which offers instructions and tips on how to build and install nest boxes. And pictured here is an eastern bluebird parent feeding insects to its baby. And the baby is just about ready to fledge, which means it's just about ready to fly by the coop or leave the nest. Eastern bluebirds use grasses and pine needles to build their nests, and they like open meadow or a woodland edge surrounded by tall native grasses that attract insects. Clutch size is between two to seven pale blue eggs, but usually about five. And the incubation period is from 11 to 19 days. And when the eggs hatch, the babies are naked or they may have a sparse tuft of feather down. Their eyes are completely closed and they can barely hold themselves up and they are 100% completely dependent on their parents to meet all of their needs. But their parents are increasingly dependent on us humans to help them. We need to plant native plants. And here's that same brood about three days later. Baby birds have the instinct to open wide and they have a brightly colored throat easy for their parents to target with food and their food, their diet consists of 100% soft bodied bugs, meaning caterpillars. So they will remain in the nest for 17 to 21 days until they're ready to fledge. And that diet of insects, that bug protein helps them to grow that quickly. And once the babies fledge the nest, 
They are still reliant on their parents for food, insects, bugs, and reliant on their parents to learn all of their survival skills in only a few short weeks. So here dad is feeding his youngster mealworms he gathered from a feeder. So you can support these growing fledglings and their parents by offering a variety of food at your feeders, such as fruit or nectar, mealworms, peanuts, seeds, all mimicking the kinds of food growing in the natural habitat. But more importantly, you can support birds and other wildlife by planting natives in your yard. So keep in mind native plants that produce fruit, seeds, and nuts, and most importantly, that host caterpillars and other insects. So fill in all vertical spaces with native plants, including trees and shrubs and vines, flowers, grasses, and ground covers, and leaves make an excellent natural mulch. And with some careful thought and planning, you can turn your backyard into a bird-friendly yard. So I'm going to uh, very quickly with permission from Nadja, if I have five more minutes to switch over to the Jersey Friendly Yards website. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. And I'll show you the, the website um, and get you on your way to selecting appropriate plants for your own yard. And then I'm happy to take any questions or answers or answer any of your questions. So here is the Jersey Friendly Yards website. So I'll actually show you the homepage and this is jerseyyards.org. So two Y's, J-E-R-S-E-Y-Y-A-R-D-S.org. Jersey Yards, Jersey Friendly Yards. So this website was actually um, created uh, through a grant from an organization, a local organization called the Barnica Bay Partnership. And they received a grant from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, specifically to, um, to uh, create healthy and clean waterways uh, because gardeners um, have, uh, I think we, we have kind of become robots in a sense about landscaping that we uh, apply fertilizer to our lawns and our yards um, twice a year in the spring and the fall, uh, but we, we, we don't normally uh, test our soil to determine if our soil actually needs any of those nutrients. It, it may have those nutrients and the plants we're growing, if they're native plants, uh, may not need those nutrients because native plants have been here long before humans and long before humans decided to apply synthetic fertilizers. So um, this website uh, was put together to share information with homeowners to teach us how to have healthier landscapes um, through and they provide lots of different resources and, and eventually we want to have healthier communities, healthier waterways and just he healthier lives. So some tools to help you um, understand how to landscape in a healthier way is this eight steps to a Jersey friendly yard. And these eight steps consist of plan before you plant, start with healthy soil, water wisely, fertilize less, minimize risk when managing pests, meaning um, minimize or eliminate the use of uh, pesticides and other poisons and uh, try to use non-toxic -to methods instead, uh, reduce your lawn, and instead plant native gardens. Um, that way you're eliminating lawn, lawn mowing, herbicides, pesticides, and all that in one fell swoop. Uh, create wildlife habitat. Lots of information here about how to create habitat. A lot of it I just talked about. And then step eight is reduce, reuse, recycle in the yard, talking about ways to compost organic matter and also um, repurpose uh, things in your garden. So you can click on any one of these and find out more information about that particular topic. Um, how to get a soil test, how to plan your garden, how to size up your space, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the eight steps to a Jersey friendly yard. Um, lots of other sources here as well, but the one I want to show you today is my favorite resource on the website, which is the Jersey Friendly Plant Database. 
And this is a database with over 400 different plants that you can search for using these search filters over on the left hand side. And there's uh, several different search filters. The more search filters um, you, you uh, actually click on and utilize, of course, you're going to start narrowing your list down more and more. Um, so first of all is the region, and I talked about the four different regions in New Jersey. We are in the coastal plain right now, so if I'm looking for plants to put in my yard, I can click coastal plain. And so I can see up here, that's one of the, um, the uh, search filters that I've identified in my list. You can see it narrowed down a little bit. And we also added some special eco regions in case you happen to live on the barrier island or near the coast, or if you live in these very special pine lands region. Um, I'm not going to click on those. Uh, plant type, we talked a lot about trees and shrubs today. So let's say I'm gonna click on tree. I'm gonna look for trees in the coastal plain. And I talked a lot about the importance of natives. Native trees are host plants for caterpillars. So yes, I want native plants only, please. And then if I want a certain uh, bloom, we don't usually look at um, color, you know, the color of bloom for trees, but certainly it will identify it for you. That would be more if you're, you're picking out flowers and probably the same with bloom time if you're picking out spring blooming flowers or summer blooming flowers or fall blooming flowers etc. Deer resistance is something that is um, inquired about a lot here in New Jersey. We have a big deer population and we might want plants that are highly deer resistant, even our trees and shrubs. Um, we may want to attract particular um, types of wildlife uh, with certain uh, plants that we're picking out. I might have a sunny or a shady spot I'm looking to uh, plant my tree in. So let's try full sun. So I've really narrowed down all my choices to only 20 trees that are coastal plain, native, high deer resistance in full sun. Uh, if I did a soil test, I can determine what soil I have. I know I have sandy soil, so I'll pick that one. I maybe did a test for my pH. We probably have slightly acidic soil. I know I do in my yard here in South Jersey. And I have very dry soil, so I'm going to pick well-drained soil. And drought tolerance, I am a very lazy gardener. I normally pick high drought tolerance for any plants I'm selecting. So I wanna save water and um, water conservation is high on my list. Uh, salt tolerance, this could be if I live on the coast or if I have a, a planting near the road where there is road salt laid down a lot, I might want a salt tolerant plant for that purpose. But so here's, here are the results of my search. Um, lots of great trees to choose from. Um, I talked a little bit about birch. Uh, there's river birch. Let's pick that one. So it's going to bring me to a page that shows me some photos of, a, of that particular species, a description of that species, and then all those plant details, whether I selected them or not, it's going to tell me uh, information about um, whether it's native or not, if it has deer, deer resistance, remember I picked high, uh, what the salt tolerance is like, um, what regions in New Jersey it grows in, uh, the soil characteristics, the needs, the light needs, the water needs, the size uh, and spread and growth rate of this particular plant. So um, I may want to uh, make a list in which case I would actually have uh, registered and then logged in prior to actually creating my, my, selecting my plants so I can actually keep track. And to do that, I would have to register or log in. And then I would click on this wheelbarrow and it would uh, turn orange. And I would know then that that plant was added to my list. I could then actually print my list of plants and take that list with me to the nursery. And a lot of times we're asked, well, where do I buy native plants? Um, so you can go here 
and we've listed nurseries that focus on maybe not every plant in stock is native, but they, they do have quite a, a good selection of natives in these nurseries we've listed by county alphabetically. And if you scroll down to the bottom of this particular page, there's also um, Pennsylvania nurseries, if you, you live uh, in the west of west side of New Jersey, um, there's some wholesale nurseries and there are some um, mail order nurseries, online retail nurseries as well. Toad Shade Farm, I buy from them, Pinelands Direct, Wild Ridge, Pollination, all these are great nurseries that um, my plants always come healthy and um, I've had lots of success. So lots of information here for you. Uh, another great list of nurseries uh, at the Native Plant Society of New Jersey website, another resource for you. Lots of resources to explore on this particular page. Um, if you have a question, you can ask an expert. This link actually goes straight to the Rutgers Cooperative Extension Master Gardeners uh, of New Jersey. Fill out this form and ask your question and um, you should get a reply. Um, you can also click this email and you would actually email um, uh, the uh, person who is in charge of the Jersey Family Yards website, my colleague, Karen Walzer, who uh, oftentimes um, we uh, cooperatively share uh, Jersey Friendly Yards programs together. So she would get this and answer your questions. So um, I encourage you to stop by jerseyfriendlyyards.org and have fun exploring this particular website. And I will uh, go back to my program. And um, if you have any questions at all, uh, please don't hesitate to email me, education at soildistrict.org. My name again is Becky LeBoy, and I just wanna give a shout out to these wonderful photographers who um, shared their photos with me uh, so I could present this program to you tonight. So thank you all so very much. Does anybody have any questions? Well, I, Becky, why, for hanging uh, why on. the peanuts? Like, does peanuts attract certain, like I'm more a sunflower kind of person. I'm sorry, say that question again. So in your feeder, you had peanuts. Mm -hmm. Does it attract the particular type of, like I'm a sunflower seed kind of person. I just wanted to see, does it attract certain varieties more than others? Yes. Uh, so different types of seed uh, or nuts or fruit will attract different uh, species of birds. Um, definitely different species have, have uh, different preferences. You're definitely likely to get uh, woodpeckers at peanut feeders, but certainly lots of other backyard birds come to peanut feeders as well white-breasted nuthatches, red-breasted nuthatches. My chickadees will come and peck at the uh, peanut tufted titmouse. So you will definitely attract an array of birds to your peanut feeder, um, blue jays. Um, but many, I would say most of those birds will also come to a sunflower feeder as well. So you can offer either or, or like me, just put out the whole buffet. <laughs> For them, uh, yes. Some birds like the really tiny thistle, especially in the winter time. You'll attract the pine siskins uh, with the thistle. Uh, you're more likely to attract the pine siskins with the thistle. Um, but in the winter, they, rather than the summer. Mm -hmm. Yep, they they come in the winter time. Yeah, they're they're gone now. Um, it's it's funny how um, every season we have different birds because of course some birds migrate and we certainly always have our backyard birds, our chickadees and our cardinals and our blue jays that stay around. Um, but some, some birds uh, arrive here in Ocean County in New Jersey for the winter. This is their south for the winter. And then when they're ready to breed in the spring, they head way north. And then in the winter, they come back here. Uh, and then some birds, we are their north. They come here and they breed. And in the wintertime, they go way south. So we get really a large variety of birds. Every season has, has different birds that will show up uh, in town to hang out for the winter or to breed for the summer or to just be there 
in our backyards year round. And when you say understory, are you saying like smaller plants or shade plants that go in that understory? Mm -hmm. So if you think of your habitat, we, we kind of look at our landscape a lot of times horizontally, but if you think of a piece of your, your backyard and you think of the vertical landscape, so you might have grasses and ground covers and ferns, and then you might have smaller shrubs, uh, which would be considered the understories. Those are all under the larger canopy. And then you have your, your larger trees, your medium-sized trees and your larger trees that form more of the canopy. So birds and lots of wildlife, but birds in particular, um, different birds, just like different birds eat different things. Uh, different birds prefer different levels of the, uh, the the canopy, either high in the canopy, low in the canopy, in the understory. Some birds prefer to nest and stay low to the ground. Um, even warbler species, different warbler species, some like it lower on the tree, some forage in the middle, and some will always stay. You're always, you know, looking with your binoculars way at the top for northern perulas. Um, and that's because ecologically speaking, uh, direct competition leads to extinction. So even though the species are really similar, if they're competing all the time, someone's going to win and someone's going to lose. But if they have slightly different niches, they're foraging in slightly different areas of the vertical canopy, uh, that reduces competition, not to say one will never go up here, never go down there, but generally speaking, that's where their species is most comfortable feeding or nesting, and it will reduce competition and increase uh, survive, survivability. And um, I'm, I'm, there was a red owl at the beginning of your presentation, and you did a box, and I forgot, what was the name of it? So that was an Eastern Screech Owl. Uh, in, in my nest box in my backyard. And they actually come in two different colors. They come in red and gray. And we call those morphs. Okay. And I love the website. Could you leave us? I mean, everybody, I, I'm taking the over all the questions, but you're welcome yeah. to ask. But can you leave up the website? I love it. They, it tells us where to buy native plants and how oh, to sure. Yeah, so maybe absolutely. go back a couple of there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Jersey uh, Friendly Yards. So yeah, so remember Jer that. Jersey Friendly Yards and then jerseyyards.org. And yeah, so there's the, the database and where to buy native plants. And we have a very active Facebook page and I'm starting to do the Twitter now too. So uh, trying to get, you know, social media out there and um you know, share different things going on in people's Jersey friendly yards. Also, importantly, um, we have a uh, webinar series, Jersey friendly yards webinar series going going on. We have one more left in our 2021. Uh, we're actually going to call it spring webinar series because we're planning a summer webinar series as well. And if you missed any of our spring uh, Jersey Friendly Yards webinars, which uh, took place January, February, March, April, May, our June one is coming up. Uh, we do have recordings for most of them. Um, some speakers prefer not to have, have their program recorded, which we understand, but you can watch the recordings. Um, and we have one coming up on June 8th, Ferocious Dragons and Dainty Damsels, presented by the amazing Pat Sutton. If you've never heard her speak, you've got to come see her program. Uh, she'll share information about how to attract uh, dragonflies and damselflies to your backyard. Um, and we're planning our uh, summer series, and that's going to be focused on uh, designing a Jersey friendly yard. Um, and this spring series, our uh, focus was what's bugging your Jersey friendly yard. So our speakers were talking about how to attract and manage um, insects and bugs in your yard in a friendly way, of course. Um, so we, we did have conferences pre COVID and then we switched to webinars. Um, we're probably never gonna switch back to just conferences because the webinars are so successful. Uh, however, we're hoping to have an in-person conference next fall in 2022, along with um, 
you know, supplemental webinars, but do check out our workshops and events. And for those of you who are involved in green groups like garden clubs or environmental commissions, and you would like me to speak on an array of topics pertaining to native plant gardening, um, I'm happy to. Uh, that's how Nadja and I connected. Um, so uh, you can contact me and um, education at soildistrict.org is my, my uh, email. So does anybody have any other questions? One once, <laughs> going twice. Well, thank you, Becky, for sharing your time with us. And thank you, your audience, for tun tuning in. Uh, You're so welcome. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Nadja, for hosting uh, my program. Thanks for the opportunity to get the word out about Jersey Friendly Yards. Not a problem. Becky will be doing um, also here a fall conference. Um, a webinar. fall webinar. So mm -hmm. we will let you know all about that yeah. later on in the year. So keep a look out on our calendar. Excellent. If you missed something or would like more clarification also, we will be showing this on May 26th, plus also showing it in our YouTube channel. And uh, Becky will also be showing it in her YouTube channel. Yep. So thank you so much for sending me the recording. We'll upload it on our Ocean County Soil Conservation District YouTube channel, where we have about a dozen different programs that I've presented uh, over this past summer. So I invite you all to find our Ocean County Soil Conservation District YouTube channel and tune in to one of our programs. And I know the Ocean County Library has an amazing collection of uh, webinars as well to explore. And books. We have books about and plants books. and native birds also from New Jersey. So feel free to check them out. Yes. And some of those I listed, like Doug Tallamy's Bringing Nature Home is an excellent book. Uh, it's made for, you know, home gardeners. So Bringing Nature Home is a good one. Well, thank you very much. You all have a great night and hope to see you again. Great. Thank you, Nadja. Thanks, everyone. Thank have a great night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Support public libraries, like, share, and subscribe for more great videos.